get an idea from, from the audience uh, to kind of you know, get a feel for you guys. How many of you are doing like big data stuff often, you know, as part of your job or fun or any of that stuff? A few people. How many people are using cloud technology for work or hobbies or anything like that? A bunch of people. Cool. OK. This will be fun then. Uh, and how many people have used BigQuery before? I'm going to be using that a lot in this talk. None of you? OK. A little bit? OK. So you guys are in for, in for some fun then. So we're going to be talking about exploring um, big data on the cloud, um, particularly with a focus on open data, because open data is cool and like it's free and open and fun, and you can do cool stuff with it. Um, we're going to be focusing on what we know, what is happening, and what we're made of. Uh, before we get into that, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Jenny. I'm a developer advocate. Um, I work on Google Cloud Platform. And uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, Twitter's a good way to do it. There are other ways, too. But if you build something cool, please show me. I like seeing what people are up to. Or if you do some really cool thing with open data, please let me know. I'd love to share that around, share it with my coworkers, see all the cool stuff you did. Give me more excuses to come out to awesome conferences like this. Um, but uh, as I said, we're talking about open data. And I don't know if everyone realizes it, but we're kind of at the, you know, the, the footsteps uh, the, of a, a revolution, on the doorstep of a revolution. A lot's happening in open data right now. And uh, there's kind of three big components of that that are happening at this very moment. Uh, the first is price. So we've had data. Data's existed forever. Data's been happening. News has been happening. But a lot of us just kind of slipped through our fingers because it was too expensive to even store that data. Uh, for example, here is uh, from 1950. This is a drum storage. Um, it's pretty big. It's at a, a museum near my place. It's about that big. It probably weighs several hundred pounds. Um, and they measured space on it a little bit differently. They measured it in characters per square inch. Um, but I translated it back to actual like uh, capacity. How much space do you think fits on this probably like thousand pound drum? 4K. It's a little better than that. It's actually about 90 kilobytes. Uh, which, but I mean, that was like a multi-million dollar piece of equipment in today's dollars back then. Uh, so 90 kilobytes on that giant thing, way less than a floppy disk, way less than anything uh, we have today. And now I can like go and buy like a micro SD card that's like the size of my thumbnail, and you can get them up to like 200 gigabytes. And I can go buy one of those at like you know a, an office supply store or a drugstore now, and um, that's like hundreds of millions of times the capacity of that thing, which is amazing. Uh, and What's also kind of crazy to think about is it took us like thousands of years to get from like etching stone tablets to that, and then only decades to get from 90 kilobytes on a huge drum to these tiny little commodity SD cards that hold tons and tons and tons of data. Uh, things are accelerating really fast. Access has also become a lot easier than ever, because people have actually been storing a lot of data historically, um, but it's been inaccessible for various reasons. People kept it hidden away in archives. But things like the development of the internet and even like changes in the way we think of data and our ownership of data, like public data especially, uh, has changed a lot. And now we can do things like Freedom of Information Act and access data we've never been able to access before. And the internet also makes it really easy to find this stuff. Uh, the screenshot's a little bit uh, blurry, but there's tons of great sites you can go to to check out open data. Um, there's like, I think a lot of people find op uh, share open data sets on Reddit. Um, there's a stack exchange just for open data requests. And there's some really cool stuff on there. Um, let's take a look at some of the stuff on there. This is uh, uh, one of my favorite data sets I found on there, which is, I guess somebody did a, 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 an information access request for it. It is, uh, got kind of compressed. But it is a list of shopping trolleys found in rivers in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone really wanted to know where all those shopping trolleys were getting pulled out by, I don't know, Department of Public Works. And they got the data set, and it got published online. And there's all sorts of really cool data out there you can find now that some of it's even much more useful than that. <laughs> Boop. Oh. Return to full screen. Yes. Um, but one other thing that's been kind of slowing us down, which has actually become a more recent problem that we've become aware of, because we just thought that data was out there. We thought storage would be the hard part. It turns out storage is the easy part. The hard part is actually kind of moving, it, moving that data around. Uh, how many people have been downloading a file only to notice five days? It's sad, especially when we're dealing with these really big data sets. Uh, and this isn't just a problem that happens in our own houses. This is a problem that happens, uh, like I spent a lot of my master's research just focused on moving data around from one supercomputer to another. 
Uh, and we ended up doing uh, this pretty often, where we take a whole bunch of tapes, stick them in a FedEx box, and ship them across the country. Because the networks just weren't good enough back then. And that was, only, that was not very long ago. Uh, it's also not very long ago that like, people's highest bandwidth device was probably this mailbox because they were getting DVDs from Netflix. But I have a whole bunch of friends now who have gigabit internet at home. And that, that's becoming widespread. And it's, it's gotten better throughout enterprise and places too. Boop. So like, things have gotten a lot easier. It's, been a lot, it's a lot easier to access the data. It's a lot easier to move it around. So now we have everything we in place. Um, but let me take a quick sidestep and talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about kind of Google. So Google has a mission. It's to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, um, which has surprising parallels to that general kind of open data movement that's happening uh, in front of our eyes. And uh, this mission has had some interesting implications. It's produced this kind of interesting virtuous cycle where we come up with a really cool idea, and we go out and we find a bunch of data or collect a bunch of data to accomplish that idea, and then we have to go invent new technology to make use of that data. Um, this could be new technology in the way we, st we store stuff. This could be software. This could be new network fabric that moves data faster so we can do cool stuff. And that, in turn, inspires us and then leads us to collect more data. And we kind of end up in this loop where we develop lots of cool tech. And uh, here's a, a list of some of our internal buzzwords, uh, some of which I, I doubt many of these are familiar. Uh, actually, some of them are probably familiar to, to those of you who've done big data stuff before. Google File System and MapReduce, um, we published some papers on that. And they became the foundations for Hadoop. Um, uh, other ones uh, have been, uh, we've actually kind of packaged up as commercial products. We have Bigtable, you can go get a cloud Bigtable now as part of Cloud Platform. Colossus and Flume became Cloud Dataflow. Um, but today we're going to talk a little bit about the technology that used to be called Dremel. Uh, Dremel is an internal technology, which was a way we could use to kind of munge through huge amounts of logs we were generating. And uh, now it's kind of packaged up as a commercial product you can use called Google BigQuery. Um, I would show you what BigQuery, I would tell you what BigQuery is, but it, it's much easier to, to show you. It's much more fun. So why don't we count some stuff? How does that sound? Okay. And we'll start with the uh, hello world of big data. Let's count the words in all Shakespeare's works. How many of you have done this before in like a lab or something? No one? Okay, this is like, like cliche, it's so common. Um, Let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to pop out of my slides. We're going to copy this code. Uh, we're going to go on over to BigQuery, um, which has this nice web interface. I'm going to make it a little smaller so we can actually see stuff. All right. <coughs> and I'm just going to paste in that query. Um, and if you notice, it's kind of like SQL. Who here knows SQL or uses SQL a little bit? Yeah, it's a really common dialect. That's why we chose to use it for BigQuery. Um, we can run it. and. About three quarters of a second, we've counted 164,656 words. But that's like tiny data. I can do that with like stuff on my command line. I can just you know, use the word count to do that. That's no fun. Uh, let's try uh, going a little bigger, shall we? So to go bigger, um, we're going to have to leave the realm of historical literature, and we're going to have to move into some modern data. Um, let's count the number of hits uh, Wikipedia got in one hour. How many hits do you think Wikipedia got in? And this was a specific hour, May 11th at 5 o'clock GMT. Because as it turns out, Wikipedia makes all of this data available. You can go download it. It's pretty cool. So how many hits do you think, oops, I just copied. How many hits do you think Wikipedia got during that specific hour? 17. 17. Oh, we can do better than that. Um, so oh, we're actually reading cache data. That's no fun. Let me turn off cache. I'm turning off the query cache. OK, it took about the same amount of time. Um, it turns out about 24 million. Uh, so we counted to 24 million in three, well, just under a second. We processed about 51 megs of data. But do um, you know what's cooler than a million, uh, a billion? Uh, so why don't we look at an entire month of data? So this is the same file from, from uh, Wikipedia. I just kind of aggregated them together. I just counted them all together and pushed them up into a big table. Let's run that. And it's taking a little bit longer. It took about four seconds, and there we do. We counted to uh, 21 billion. Uh, we processed about 43 gigs of data. Uh, but you know what's cooler than a billion? A uh, trillion. Uh, 
And actually, uh, I have to admit, I had a little trouble getting enough log data together uh, just because it took a while to download it from Wikipedia because they apparently don't have the fastest internet connections. But I got about 10 months of data together, um, a lot of 2014 data and a little bit of more recent 2015 data. And let's just count all the requests over um, those 10 different months. They're not actually consecutive. There's some gaps in there. And it's taking a little bit longer, but you know, this is a lot of data. So how many uh, requests do you think we got over 10 months of Wikipedia? Trillions? 10 times one month. Yeah, that's probably a good bet. But there are different months. Uh, and actually, some of those months were busier. So we ended up with uh, 446 billion. So not quite a trillion, just because I couldn't quite get a trillion uh, requests worth of data uh, together in time. But I mean, we're, on the, we're on the order of magnitude of that. And you know what would be crazy to do with uh, requests across you know, uh, a query on, on the order of a trillion requests of data? Uh, why don't we uh, run a regular expression on it? So what would this do to most relational databases? It would make them sad. But we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> So what we're doing here, uh, to kind of take a peek at the query, um, I'm doing a subselect where I'm getting all that data, and then I'm going through the titles. So um, instead of just, just aggregating the requests, I'm going to take the titles, and I'm going to look for titles that match a regular expression that is variations of my first name. So Jennifer, Jenny, stuff like that. And then, um, then I'm summing, then I'm in the outer select, I'm going to do a summation on it. So I can run that, and this one's pulling in a lot more data because in addition to just the um, request counting, I actually have to do run the regular expression in each one of those records. Um, hopefully it won't take too long. Oh, 13 seconds. So we processed about 2.7 terabytes of data, and it turns out that during that time period, 178 million requests went to pages where the title contains variations of my name. Um, but that's no fun. Uh, what's some other word we can look for? Does anyone have a regular expression they'd like to run on Wikipedia titles? Uh, actually, that wouldn't be a JEN because it's uh, the plus is mandatory. Oh, the plus is mandatory. So it's going to be, so it wouldn't get the, the page for Jen. OK, let's, let's fix that. Let's run it on star. Why would you do this? test Yes. This is crowdsourcing from the audience. I swear this isn't the result of me working on slides at 2 in the morning and making a mistake in a regular expression. That never happens. Sure. Let's do that once, once this one's done. So th that start takes a little bit longer, it turns out. Running to thir 30 seconds. OK, Let, let's go over to your name. That one sounds more fun. So I'm going to abandon that query. It's just telling me it's still going to keep running. So what, what should we look for? Jordan. Jordan. Dot star. All the variations. Let's do a dot star in front of it. So we're going to do the middle, too. We'll see if this one bounces back. Yeah, because we want to get Michael Jordan and other, other ones. So this is uh, how many people have run a SQL career that's run for days <laughs> or weeks? Yeah, those are no fun. That's what I feel like when this thing's taking more than 20 seconds. Eh. We'll see how long that runs. This is apparently you've given me the, the, the query that makes it a little sadder. OK. So um, we'll come back to that in a couple slides. Unless it's already done. Nope, still running. Where is my presentation? So how did it do that? Is anyone wondering that right now? Talk a little bit about the tech before we get to the open data. Um, but first, let's talk about relational databases. Everyone's used relational databases before at one point or another, right? What are some qualities you'd look for in evaluating a relational database? You might look for like, good behavior and inserts and like, precise locking. You might look for like, really intelligent indexes, a whole bunch of different options for different kinds of indexes you might want to use. So you can like, you know, not have to do full table scans, because those are terrible. You're probably going to look for caching, because you know, What's cheaper than full table scans is, you know, even you know, cheaper than index scans is, is just pulling data from a cache, which is awesome. Uh, and then to pull all that together, you want like really sophisticated, smart machine learning, heuristic-based query planning. And that's cool. Uh, but uh, we thought all those things were hard, so we decided not to do any of them. <laughs> um, we're just like, those are hard. We want to do something else. Um, 
So instead, we took uh, that problem and just split it up a lot. Uh, a lot. We just found a lot of hard drives. There's one hard drive. A lot of hard drives. A whole freaking lot of hard drives. So what we do is we take the data and we just slice it up and copy it and put it all over the place. Because as it turns out, if you take the data and you spread it out across tens of thousands of drives, you can move the data around really fast. Who knew? It's like RAID on steroids. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. Actually, let's take a look back at that query. Boop. So it ran, oh no, two minutes. Why are you slow? Jordan, you found the evil one. Let's try giving that one another kick. Yeah, it means you're really popular. And let's try narrowing that data set a little bit. Because apparently, I was a little bit too crazy. So we're going to run it on one month of data. That came back pretty fast. Regexes are more fun. More fun than like. Okay, but for one month, it was about 4,325,000. Let's give it another try on the, the full data set. Okay. But anyway, uh, so how do we slice it? Uh, so how does we, so when you, we end up, uh, when you ask us to store data, you typically tell us to store a table. You're going to either do a batch upload or maybe you'll slice it up um, and kind of stream data in, something like that. But in general, you're going to be sending us tables of data, like logs. Logs are great tables. Uh, and then what we do is we slice it up into columns. Because as it turns out, that uh, not only do you only need certain columns for certain queries, um, but when you slice data up into columns, it compresses so much better. Compression is awesome. Um, not necessarily for the, the storage, but mostly just because it's easier to move data around if it takes up less network space. And then we take that and we just make copies and slices and put it on a whole bunch of disks. All right. Let's see if my big query came back. Oh, it did come back. So it ran in uh, 12 seconds this time, 11.8 seconds. I guess I had kind of pre-cached some of that stuff from the disks. And uh, 46 million. So it turns out various intergen is significantly more popular. I had 178 million. I know. I'm sorry. OK. Yep. So that is how we store data. Let's talk a little bit of how data, um, how we actually do the query execution. Here's another query. Um, it's a little bit different. In this query, what we're doing is we are counting the births. Um, we're looking at some public data um, from census data. Um, we're counting births from 1980 to 1990. And um, we're, or we're grouping them up by state. And then we're finding the top 10 states and how many babies are born there. Um, let's actually see what the data looks like. So I'll switch out. Boop. Let's just run this query. Run query. And uh, it turns out California, Texas, and New York, not a huge surprise. The biggest states have the most births. Uh, Three million births during that period of time. Um, but let's, let's see how this query actually runs. So kind of digging into here. Um, so the big query execution looks like is we have these things called mixers, um, which do most of the work, including one special mixer called a root mixer. Um, and then we have leaf nodes. And all leaf nodes really know how to do is read from disks. Uh, and when a query comes in, one of those mixers gets picked. It becomes the root mixer. And then it builds out this cohort of other mixers and leaf nodes. And depending on the complexity of your query, there may be many layers. Um, for the query I just showed you, we only have like a group by and account. Uh, uh, so there's only two layers of mixers. Uh, and then a whole bunch of leaf nodes. Uh, the more data you have, the more leaf nodes. Um, and uh, this, this, makes sense. this ends up making it scale kind of flat. So when I run my query, the query gets propagated down. The storage goes and figures out what data do you actually want, what columns did you ask for. So it's going to take those columns, and it's going to send them up to the leaf nodes. Um, for this particular query, it's about 140 million records that get bubbled up to the leaf nodes. They're going to do everything they can. In this case, they're going to be doing your where clause. So they're going to be dropping a bunch of records that don't match. Um, then they're going to be grouping, and then they're going to be counting, because this is, this is they can do on each individual record. This can be distributed out to each, you know, each slice. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different copies of those counts, um, which gets passed up to the next layer of mixers, uh, about 50, probably about 50 from each leaf node at this point. Uh, and then it's going to do that count again and regroup them, because um, it can keep aggregating that count. And then it'll finally pass those 50 records up to the top, where we limit it by 10, so we drop off those states we care less about, and then we finally do the final sort. Uh, so it's a whole lot of data. You just move up, we just kind of like full scan, and then like just drop data as we go. So we overfetch and you know, drop data on the floor, which is cool, because it's fast, and it scales relatively flat. 
uh, until if you ever find the limit of the, the number of drives you could spin at once, that would be the limit. But I haven't hit that yet. OK. And this is, um, yeah, let's move on. Let's talk a little about open data since we've been, we've been uh, since now you kind of have a basic idea of how BigQuery works. Um, and uh, this is a lot of data is available now, which is pretty cool. Why don't we talk about genomics? Um, how many of you uh, have played around with genomics data before? Nobody? Have any of you done 23 and me? 20, oh, one person, yeah. So that's not actually, uh, what we're going to be dealing with is, is sequence data, which is a little bit different than the genotype data that 23 and me gives. Um, but let's talk a little about genomics and just the kind of scale of data you have to deal with. So here's, here's letters, A, C, T, and G. This is actually from um, some genotype data of me. I actually just took a chunk of it and put it on a slide. Uh, and these, are the, these letters make up the blueprints of us as beings. And these are the same letters that are used for all life forms on Earth, which is really cool uh, because it makes a lot of our kind of proteins interoperable and stuff. Um, and we've made a lot of progress at decoding this, or actually figuring out this code uh, over the last few decades. And uh, big blocks of A, C, T's, and G's are not very helpful, but we've come up with a lot of ways to encode that data. And those, those, those different ways of encoding have, be have become available. <coughs> and they've become a lot easier over time, too. So if you look back to like, you know, the first genome we sequenced early in this century, the Human Genome Project, it took us about 20 years to sequence that person. Um, and as time has passed, it's gotten much, 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 much cheaper, which is producing gargantuan amounts of data, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think this is the only um, time I've ever seen a line move down quite that fast on a logarithmic graph. <coughs> where we've gone from the cost per genome from you know, $100 million down to thousands of dollars per person, which is just crazy. And this is producing huge amounts of data, um, which is great because we get to play with it. And uh, uh, people are do using, using the you know, BigQuery to do real research now um, on genomic stuff. Because um, I'm, not, I'm not a geneticist, so I really don't know a whole lot about this stuff. But other people do, like the... Uh, the See, what's that? What does ISB stand for? Let me look it up in my notes. The Institute for Systems Biology and the National Cancer Institute have been using uh, BigQuery to do some research, which is cool, um, because as a result, we've gotten uh, the Thousand Genome Project available as an open data set. Um, and Autism Speaks, uh, which is an organization doing research into autism, has also been using uh, BigQuery to do genetic research uh, to try and find stuff. Um, lots of jargon I don't quite understand. Uh, we have a blog post about that, too, which is pretty cool. But we're here to talk about practical stuff, right? Like actually poke at data. So let's poke at some genetics data. I don't know much about genomics. I spent like the last couple weeks trying to learn enough to come up with some really cool queries to show you. Um, but this is about as far as I could get um, during those couple weeks. Because like apparently it's a really big topic with lots of expertise in it and stuff. Um, but we have, uh, we have a data set I wanted to play with, which is the Thousand Genome Project. So we, we spent all the time sequencing one genome. And, boop. Uh, then shortly after that, we decided, why don't we just sequence a thousand? And what having a thousand genomes does is allows us to make comparisons between different people and use that to try and figure out what all those letters mean. And here's a really, really, really simple query. Uh, apparently, uh, what we're doing here is we are comparing. So the way that the, 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 those genomes are organized is they're organized by kind of like variants from a reference, uh, a reference variation. And what we can do is, oops, I got a spoiler, is we can do this uh, principal uh, coordinate analysis, or what is it called? PCA graph, principal component analysis. Um, and we can build these using BigQuery really easily. So what you can do is you can kind of look out there, and this is kind of like hypothesis hunting. So what you can do is you can go take this enormous set of data with tons and tons and tons of variables, and you can plot a few different dimensions on a graph and try and find patterns, which you can use to build hypotheses, which you can use to design experiments to determine, you know, actually make science happen. So this is really early in the step. And uh, kind of the hello world of genomics is apparently this query, which is a pretty big hello world. Uh, <laughs> what this one does is you go through uh, all thousand genomes, which it turns out is a lot of data, and then you look for everybody's variations from the reference genes, and then you sum up those variations, and then you plot them on a chart, 
which is pretty cool. Because then you end up seeing all these different clusters of people. And it's like, huh, people are clustering. I wonder why they're clustering. And as it turns out, um, boop, you add one more variable. You compare them. You go back to those, those 1,000 people, because each one of those 1,000 people is identified by code. We have some metadata about them. We have um, their, their gender. We have uh, uh, you know, some other histor medical history information. But we also have what they call the superpopulation, which is basically ethnicity. And it turns out if you just take people's full sets of genetic variation and you just plot them on a chart, you can actually, they cluster pretty, pretty closely by, by uh, ethnicity, which you know, makes a lot of sense. Because they, you know, that has to do with the historical stuff or you know, where the genes came down from, the branching of the common ancestors, uh, which is cool. But charts are only so fun to look at. Let's try running this query and see what happens. Uh, BigQuery, I don't have any graphing software set up for it right now, but we can kind of get an idea of what it takes to run this kind of thing, which is one reason why <laughs> Hello World in Genomics is so sad, because you end up having to build these whole big clusters to crunch data to do even Hello World. So just to do Hello World, we had to process uh, a terabyte of data, <laughs> which is sad, uh, but around about 12 seconds. And this is, these are actually the pixels that you saw, you saw on the chart. Uh, these are their names. So somebody has a great name, HG00130. Let's see if we can find out a little bit about HG00130. So these are in sample info. So boop. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a thing you should never do in BigQuery. I'm going to do a select star because I know this table is tiny. Yeah, it's only 800 kilobytes. That's like nothing. Um, Where, let's see, let's see what we can learn about HG0130. And yeah, it's pretty flat. It took me about the same amount of time to do 812 kilobytes of data as you know, many, many gigabytes. Uh, they're British, female, and that's about all we know about them, which is pretty cool. But yeah, you can kind of dig around and learn a whole lot about these people, which is fun. OK. Enough about genomics. Let's talk about something that's a little bit, little bit more familiar to us. What's happening? So GDELT is this really cool project where they're taking all of the news of the world um, and they're making it in this big, they're kind of making this big uniform data set. This one's really, really fun to dig through. And um, we can do all sorts of cool stuff like this. Like we can look at the uh, events per month. So basically, we can look at the amount of news that's happening for a specific location, specific region, specific group of people, specific all sorts of stuff. And what's really cool about um, the GDAL data is it has multiple regions and like countries. So you can actually figure out like um, historical evolution of the ties between different countries and stuff like that. Um, so we're picking Romania because uh, one of my coworkers already made these pretty graphs for Romania. Um, but it, it illustrates this really interesting point, is that the first thing you do is you just kind of look for the number of events that happen, uh, the, the amount of news coming out by month um, for a, a country or a location or even a state. Um, you're going to see this the same look and graph that comes out every time. And that's because we're starting to store more news than ever. And this is a common pattern you're going to see in pretty much any of your time series big data stuff, is it just looks like now is the most interesting time. Which is not necessarily true, even though it seems like it sometimes. Um, what we have to do is you kind of normalize that data over time. Just by adding one term, you just kind of normalize it by the total count of news from everywhere. So if I just take it and I just you know, do the ratio of news from that place to the news for the rest of the world combined, then I find out how much, how notable that place is relative to the rest of the world. And for the case of Romania, a couple events popped out. Um, that have little spikes. There's a GA protest, and then in 1989, I think there was like a significant natural disaster. Um, oh, what, what was it? 1989. That was probably a political event. Uh, but we're not in Romania right now. Let's look at some other part of the world, shall we? So let's grab this query. Boop. And so we have this for Romania. Um, what this is doing is action geo country code. And this is kind of what you end up doing with this data. You kind of poke around to try and figure out how this data is actually structured. So we're going to go to GDELT, which I have. GDELT full, which I have right here. And this is the events table we're looking at. Um, and we're going to see the structure of it. Unfortunately, they give us all sorts of neat schema information. 
Um, we don't want to look for country code. Let's, why not look at something happening closer to home, like Florida? So, so you have action geo, vector one ethnic code. Boop. So you have country code. Is there anything else? Oh, ADM1 code, um, which would refer to potentially states of the United States. OK, so let's change this query a little bit. Let's do boop. And let's search for, let's see if we can find some notable events in Florida's history. Let's so run this query. Um, we have a time series data. Not much news happening. Um, actually, there's no news happening because I have the wrong thing there. So let's dig into that table a little bit more. Boop. So we have events. Um, See, we want to see what the values are for, for that uh, country code. Or actually, I'd already done it ahead of time. So I know it's USFL is actually the value. But we can dig around in that table and we can figure out what it's supposed to be. Doo -doo -doo. Okie doke. So not much notable data. This is just time series from the beginning. Um, what we can do is we can order that. So group by, order by one. Let's order by uh, two. Let's order by the most notable time. And see if we can find anything. Sometimes this data is a little bit noisy. Um, and we find that there's been some recent ones. Uh, apparently, the first of March has some. Usually, it's good to look for spikes, like August. And then what we can do is we can dig into this table further and look for the titles of those news events that happened. But these are all really close to statistical noise. I think we have to use a bigger, a bigger net. But yeah, we can dig around. You can kind of find those different spikes for different countries, which is pretty cool, in different places in the world, and different relationships between them. And that's news. Let's talk about something else. Why not talk about weather? Um, and there's this really cool data set called GSOD. Does anyone know what GSOD might stand for? Global summary of the day, because NOAA is really, really creative at coming up with acronym names. Um, yeah, so global summary of the data. Apparently, this is data that we've been collecting forever, uh, even though it has kind of a silly name. But you can do really cool stuff with it. We can do things like we can look at precipitation. Um, here we have more Romanian data, which is not as fun. What we can do is we can, we can build these really cool time series charts of precipitation and temperature ranges over time. And why don't we do that for local data instead? Actually, we're running on time. I'm going to start blitzing through slides so I have time for a few questions. Why not? Um, let's talk about Freebase. So Freebase is this really cool thing where someone has gone out there and taken a whole bunch of data on the web and made it all cool and structured. Has anyone here poked up Freebase? It's really cool. It's actually one of my favorite. It's a set of relationships, a set of triples between different data all over the world. Um, and it has all sorts of stuff in there, like things, people, places, events. And this is kind of like gold for doing really neat associative analysis. Um, this is actually one of the big sources for the Google Knowledge Graph. And it's really cool, and everyone can contribute, and the licensing is really favorable, so you can use it in all your crazy projects. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite ones to play with. Oh, you can download the whole thing, too, um, which I did. Or actually, my, my coworker did, Felipe did. Um, we can just see things like age distribution of people um, to find out when are the most notable places, you know, wh what is the most notable age? What is the age at which people are most likely to get added to Freebase? Basically, what's the age at which someone's going to take the time to add them to Wikipedia or Freebase? And as it turns out, uh, after looking at a whole lot of records, it, it seems that people peak at, no, that's not nice, 29, that's no fun. Apparently, 29 is the most notable age for people. Um, and you can also, one cool thing is we can take this data and we can mash it up with other data which can result in these monster queries. Um, this is a really huge query. And what this really huge query does is it goes through Freebase data, and it finds the most prominent women for a specific period of time. And the way it does that is it goes through Freebase, it looks for all people, pulls out all the women, and then what it does, it goes and it does uh, join on uh, all the requests on Wikipedia uh, based on their names. So what we do is we kind of parse out the Wikipedia URIs to find names, and then we compare them to all the women on Freebase. And this is the monster query that I'll, I'll be leaving you guys with. Uh, so let's take a look. This was for, boop, 
which time period was this for? Let me scroll that down. So normally I go pull some data from Wikipedia and just do the, the last hour, um, but I want to leave some time for questions. So we're just going to use, how about the month of May? Um, what's really cool then is Freebase also has the location they live, so we can take that data and we can plot it on a map, which is kind of cool. So let's run that query. And it does its query thing. Lots of joins, lots of data, lots of stuff like that. And then I'm going to pull up a little tool that takes the output and then plots it on a map, which is kind of cool. I guess BigQuery is a little busier right now than it was last night. Oh, there it goes. Only 18 seconds. Um, again, downloaded a CSV. Open it up in the best text editor ever. Oh, I've kind of spoiled it by, by opening up in the text editor. But what we can do is we can take that and we can plot it on this map. And we can see that for specific countries, we can see the, the most queried people on Wikipedia who are women um, for specific places in the world. And these are the kind of things, what's she doing out there? <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, uh, she's out there on an island somewhere. Oh, yeah, Bermuda, I guess that makes sense. But yeah, these are the, the kind of cool monster data. So anyway, we just looked at a whole bunch of data. Um, and I hope I illustrated to you that like, we really are on the steps of revolution. This is stuff that you can go do right now. Um, you can use BigQuery. There's a whole bunch of other technologies that are also available now that you can use too. Um, BigQuery is just fun because you don't have to buy servers for it. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that have, have come together to make this happen now. Um, prices have come down. We have access to more data than we ever have before. And we're able to move that data around faster than we ever have. Um, who thought we'd spend that much energy moving data around? Uh, no one probably saw that one coming. Um, so you can try it right now. Um, one cool thing about BigQuery is your first terabyte each month is free. So you can do a whole bunch of those queries. You can dig around on a lot of open data. The genomic stuff uh, will all use more than a terabyte. But everything else I did, you can probably play around with right now, which is a lot of fun. Um, and does anyone have any questions? So the question is about pricing. How does pricing work with BigQuery? So um, entering, uh, bringing data in is uh, free if you do it in batch. Um, streaming data in has a cost um, per, uh, per byte being streamed in, but it's pretty low. Um, we store a little bit for storage, although that data, that price is coming down a lot. Most of the cost comes from the queries. And for queries, we charge by um, uncompressed terabyte of data you use for your query which is why you never want to do a select star on a really big table. That's a bad idea. It'll be expensive. Um, but you can actually see, like, uh, you can uh, either use, if, if you're using the visual thing like I was using, you can actually pop down a little thing. It'll tell you how much data it's going to process and how much it'll cost. Or if you're using the API, you can actually ask it ahead of time how expensive a query will be. Um, yeah, because it, it, it's uh, one cool thing about BigQuery is it'll pull a whole bunch of machines in at once, um, but that has the, the double-edged sword of being able to pull in a whole bunch of machines at once. Like 10,000 machines that you use for one query is a lot. Um, yeah, even if you're only using it for a few seconds. Uh, hopefully not. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Any other questions? Your slides will be available on your site? My slides. Oh, cool. Yeah, so the, um, I'm going to have to... Yeah, let me think. I'm thinking through the rights. Yeah, the slides will be available. So um, I'll, be, I'll be tweeting that out um, soon. Any other questions? And then you'll be able to run all the queries from that. Cool. OK, well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. I hope you had fun. <laughs>